Acts 28. We are going to cover two chapters tonight. Well, we're going to finish 28 and do Acts 29. And I, I, I'm well aware that Acts only has 28, but uh, what I, the one thing that I, I, I saw repeatedly uh, at the end of everybody's commentaries was, uh, this does not cover the end of this does not cover the end of uh, Paul's life, um, and uh, so I was like, oh well, okay. And then we'll we'll try to get we'll try to get him to the end of the story at least a little bit tonight. Um, so that's why I call it. People are going to be confused online. They're going to go Acts 29. What's he talking about? Because that's what my title is going to be. Acts 29. Going to make them really work for it. Um, let's see here. Where do I read? Because literally, uh, not a whole lot of excite uh, excitement. Um, let's let's start at verse 26. Verse 26 is where he answers them after some of them believed and some of them didn't believe. Um, and uh, so he, uh, he, he answers them out of Isaiah um, chapter 6. And he says, saying, go unto this people and say, uh, hearing ye shall hear and not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not, uh, not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears is dull, ears is dull of hearing. That's the Eastern Kentucky version. These are, ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their hearts, under, uh, uh, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. It's kind of interesting. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is free of charge. I'm not. Uh, this is not in my notes, so it could be one of the problems. But have you ever thought about the fact of you know people? Who, I don't understand why I'm not healed. I don't understand why things aren't working out for me. Um, I, I, may, I, I go to a faith church. Um, I, I, I listen. I go consistently. Um, but, but notice it says uh, they're, um, they're dull of hearing. Um, their eyes, they close. They're, they, uh, well, lest they should hear with their ears. So here, um, the, the quote that I have up here, the joke that I have up here, uh, my wife, or they, they say that uh, everybody's wife complains that uh, their husbands don't listen to them. And he says, it's funny, I've never heard my wife say that. And it's, and it's kind of the way it is with the word, is that um, I, I remember years back when John Evanzini came for the first time and he had preached. Um, he, has, he has sermons that he preaches uh, when he goes to, a, he used to, first time in a church, I'm going ABCs. And I'm not doing anything else than that the first couple nights. Well, after the first night, he looked at my dad and was like, your people seem like they've heard this before. He goes, yeah, yeah we, we listen to it all the time. We preach it all the time. And, and immediately he, he went on to something deeper. But the funny thing was at the end of that night, one of the people that had been with him since he, uh, came from uh, the denominational church in Lexington, which was back in 92, uh, said, came up to me and goes, Pastor, I heard something tonight that I've never heard before. And I, my dad was like, okay. Well, he said, when, you're, when you sow seed, you're literally not losing it. You're investing it. You're investing it in the kingdom, and it'll come back. My dad said, I'm glad you got it. He said, I've been preaching it for a long time, but I'm glad you, if it took this to get it got well, that's kind of the way it is. Is that is that when, when you're not when you're not hearing, you can you can listen to the sermon and not hear it. You can understand the ABCs of it and not hear it. Um, we could go through this room tonight and give a test on faith. I could have a, a form out. And say, you know, faith this, faith this, what's this, what's this, fill in the blank here, whatever. And, and I would guarantee you that uh, at probably 90%, if not 100% of people in this room, a part of our body would get 100% of that test. But that test means nothing. That means, you, that, that means you've listened, but you've not heard. See, it says, it says lest they should see with their eyes, Hear with their hearts, not listen, 
not suffice something, but to actually hear it, to take it apart of themselves, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. It's when your heart gets involved in the understanding that you truly understand. And it's when your heart gets involved in it that you put it to work, that you start working it. You know your heart's gotten involved when you're doing what's been preached. Just because you know how the tithe works, until you tithe, it's not going to work for you. And until you tithe, you haven't gotten in your heart. You've not heard it. You become dull of hearing. I know a lot of people that when it comes to Pastor Thad or Pastor Lisa or Pastor Mike talking about the tithe, their ears kind of go to a different frequency. Uh, you know, there, there's a, we used to do that on the radio because you had to listen to whatever they play on the radio. And if it was a song you didn't like, you just hit, you know, you went from this channel, you would just hit it over to this channel, went over that, because you, what's on there? Because I don't like that song. Now we just hit skip right on our, on our, on our iPhones. We, well, if we don't want to listen to that song, we'll skip that song. What I do is I, I everything that goes on my, on my iPhone, I put on the, um, I put on on, a, on iTunes. I don't just do it over uh, the cloud. I put it on iTunes, and all I do is I delete that song if I don't like it. And people do that with the teaching of the word. Oh, pastors teach it on faith. I've heard all this stuff on this, and they and they they turn the channel. It might be turned to Facebook. It might turn to uh, to Instagram. It might turn to whatever, but they turn the channel. Beloved, if we're going to enjoy the healing and enjoy the restoration, enjoy the, all the things that God has, has in store for us, we need to do more than just show up. And and uh, and I've heard this sermon before. We need to see with our eyes, hear with our ears, and understand with our hearts. Because he said, if you'll do that, then you'll get healed. Be it known therefore unto you, that, uh, that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and that uh, they'll hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed uh, and had great reasoning among themselves. That word reasoning would be, would be kind of like conversations. They discussed the things, which, you know, sometimes you don't need to have them make a decision. You just need them leaving discussing things, even if it's within themselves, just inside of them talking. Um, but But here's the point. And, I, and, I, and this is just subtle here. But basically he said, listen, we're, we're, the, the Gentiles are going to hear it and they're going to receive it. But God wants me to make it available to all men. And here's the point I'm saying, is that tithing works. Will it work for you? Because somebody's going to work, someone's going to bring, bring the tithe into the storehouse that they may meet in his house. And they're going to prove him and he's going to pour out the windows of heaven and open up such a blessing that there's not room to receive it all. And that, that, that those people will be blessed. Those people will enjoy the blessings of God. They'll be a delightsome land. They're, the devourer will be rebuked on their, on their life when he's busy on your life. They've set an alarm on their house. They've got the was it ADF sign out front that says, I'm a tither. And the enemy can't even come close to that house. So what's the how, what, what he's going to do? He's going to go to the next house that doesn't have the I'm, the I'm a tither sign, and he's going to devour. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And so it's going to work. It's just a matter on who's going to receive it and understand with their hearts and take it and put it to work. Amen? All right, all right. Verse 30. Okay. Spent a little time there, but... And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came unto him. Um, two whole years just probably means there was a backlog on standing before Caesar. And so he just had time, which again didn't bother him because he desired, uh, Rome, the, the book of Romans was written about 57 AD, I believe it is. And these numbers vary between people, I'm just going to give you kind of the one that I saw most commonly, um, that the, that the a book of Romans was written about 55 to 57 BC, or AD, and, and, uh, and he was in prison in Rome between 60 and 62 AD. And so, uh, so he, he let them know, I want to come to you. 
He said, and we'll, we'll look at this in chapter 15 of Romans. Uh, we're probably not going to look it up because if we look up every scripture that I'm going to talk about tonight, it could take a little longer. Um, but he said, I, I want to come to you while I'm on my journey to Spain. I, so I want to come to you. So he's desired to come there. Well, now he's there, so he's not necessarily in a hurry. He wants to stay there in probably one of the most theological books in the Bible is Romans. It is probably, I, I preached through it. I forget, it was four years for that one. Amen. It's a shorter book. So I got, but I mean, I tell you what, getting into that was a humdinger. I'm telling you, it just, it is so deep and so thorough. And so, and, and uh, I think if I went through it probably again today, yeah, I maybe even take longer time because it, it's so deep. Well, that's that's who he wrote. He wanted them. They were they were in the Greek lands. They were they were away from from the Jewish uh, from that. So, so they were around a lot of junk. As bad as Ephesus was, and as bad as as Corinth was, Rome was the hopping perversion center of the universe. And, and, and so so he he was pouring out in, in, in that in that book. Um, but so he wasn't in a hurry, but at the same time he was there until he saw Caesar. Um, and, and then it was in his own hired house, which again we've already talked about that it was a rented house or a bought house. Um, I've heard some people say bought, but this word hired literally means rented. Um, Rick Renner says that Paul uh, uh, owned the house until the day he died. So I'm guessing either he paid it up or he kept paying it or or they the church there used it. I, I it doesn't really say, uh, but he was not in prison. Now later later about six years later when he gets arrested and and actually leads towards his death, uh, he is put in the prison. But this one he comes straight off of uh, Melita and and has is loaded out this. You know, I get really frustrated with people who write who write um, commentators, commentate, com, com, commentaries, Thank you. who write commentaries and don't really read the context of things. I, I read one today, and, and and he was talking about him ha having a house there, and, and he said apparently he probably worked as a, a tent maker while he was there so that he could afford the house. He left. Molita with gobs of money. They heavily loaded him down with wealth. That's why he was able to stay in a house like that. And there's nothing, you're assuming there. Again, in context, that's the only way he paid for it was with that. You got to add context to it to say he was a tent maker because he would. No, he all day long it said it says there and received all that came to him. Everybody that came to him with did they need prayer? He received them. Did they need counseling? He received them. Did they want to sit and hear the word? He received them. That was his job. It is okay for a man of God to have a secular job. It is okay. I'm not I will never demean that. I will say this, it is better if he can make his living in the word. Now a lot of people don't like that. Jesus did. Well, that's Jesus. Yeah, no. He's our example. He had 12 men follow him and told them to leave their occupation. They didn't go back to their occupation until they thought he was dead and gone, and then they went back to think, well, we better, this is better. And then God was like, nah. -uh. All right, I, I'm, I'm preaching on stuff that's not on my notes, but um, but he received everybody that came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Now I want to hit just two quick two quick points before we move on to Acts 29, um, and, and and it's just simply this: if we were to go back to the beginning. How many remember sitting in Pastor uh, Elisa and Neil's house and Pastor Thad saying we're going to start a series and we all thought, oh, this will be a couple week uh, thing or something like that. And, uh, and, and we started there in Acts chapter 1 and 
wow, it would have been baby Reese, wouldn't it? Um, and and we're uh, and, and we were just you know it's go ahead to start in Acts. And I read it on Sunday too, uh, but Acts chapter one verse eight where it says, um, uh, but but you shall receive power. Uh, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And and, and it kind of took me, uh, it, it, I, I paused there for a second because I was thinking, here we are finishing Acts tonight. Uh, we're literally wrapping this up. It seems so, I, I do know where we're going next week, kind of. I just got to get the exact details down. Um, but, but, but here we've been going through this and we're at this point. And at the very first of it, Paul wasn't even, wasn't even in the Christian circle. And God said, when you receive the Holy Ghost, you'll receive power. And you must be my witnesses. You must be my witnesses here. You must, a little, little uh, Dr. Seuss here. You must be my witnesses here. You must be my witnesses there. You must be my witnesses everywhere. That's right. It's, that is literally what he said. And, and, and again, this was not... I like, we brought it out on Sunday, uh, verse, chapter 4, or, or chapter 1, verse 4. He says, this is my command. Go there until this happens. Don't try to do anything until this happens. But once this happens, be my witnesses. Go. Do something. Do so. Share the goodness of God with others. Share the power of God with others. Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Don't just stand, don't, don't just stand around and, and go, mm, it feels good. Because God's power was not created just so that you could feel good. It was created, it was given to you to change lives and for you to be witnesses, for you to convince others of its power. Well, I pastor that I'm not a preacher like you. That's not necessarily what convincing means. But at the same time, when you got the Holy Spirit in you, He's giving you secrets and He's giving you answers that you didn't know beforehand. But here we are, chapter 9, Paul gets born again. And somewhere along the lines, he said, I'm going to take that very seriously. I'm not going to take it as just a Bible fact. I'm not going to take it as something I heard from Luke. I'm not going to take it as something that, 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 that I heard down the, down the chain. Oh, yeah, we were standing there in the, in the field, and Jesus said this and this. Just before he sent it, I remember it so clearly. I'm not going to just take it as something that someone said Jesus said. I'm going to take it as something that applies to me. And I, being filled with the Holy Ghost, Paul said, I speak in tongues more than y'all. So he got the power and he said, I will not stop. I will not slow down. I'm going to take this assignment seriously. And I will take the gospel to every corner of this world and God will supply. Sometimes we get more worried about the supplying than we do about the assignment. Well, Pastor, that you've got to be real in this world. Well, if you're if 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 you're if you want to be real, then you uh, 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 the Bible's real too. Amen. And if He's calls, He will equip. If He calls, He will supply. He never called anybody and had them fight on their own, uh, uh, supply their own way. So this is about 30 years after Jesus ascended. Probably more, a little more, maybe a little less. But it's about 30 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. And it was still as real to Paul that day as the first day he heard about it. Beloved, I'm just going to simply say this. and I'll move on to the next thing. Often we can, we, we can get assignments. We can get words from God. We, you can hear pastor preach on something, and that day it's so real to you. God can speak to you in the quietness of your own. You write it in your, your, your daily journal, and you're like, this is so real to me, and it means so much to you at that moment. But then as time passes, the, the essentialness of it, the direction of that begins fading. 
And the thing that once seemed so important doesn't seem so important anymore. You know, I've heard the statement that if, that if the Lutherans would have continued the path they were on, there would have been no need for the Methodists. And if the Methodists would have continued the path they were on, there would have been no need for the Pentecostals. And if the Pentecostals would have kept the route, the, the thing they were on, there would have been no need for the Charismatics. Beloved, are the Charismatics keeping on the road that we're supposed to be on? Or is that fire that was at the beginning starting to wane, starting to let up a little bit? That's why the Holy Spirit moved on my heart to preach on Sundays about baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because again, that direction, that power that, that, that is essential for us to do what we're doing, we, we're not taking it lightly. We're not taking it as seriously as we used to. How many days go between you speaking in tongues? How many words do you spend a day that are not tongues versus how many are tongues? Beloved, Paul got the assignment. And here he is at least, probably for him, but 20 years later, maybe something on that or uh, Here he is later in, 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 the, in the time spread. And it means as much to him at that point as it did to, to the disciples when Jesus said it in Acts 1. Beloved, what has God called you to do? What has he told you to do specifically? What has come up in life that has allowed that to become secondary or further? Because whatever's gotten in between there, you need to get that removed and get the fire. G G Paul told Timothy, he said, don't let the fire die. Don't let that fire that, was, that, that burned in your mother and your grandmother, don't let that fire that's in you, don't let it fade out. Keep it ignited. How can I do what Paul did? By keeping those things ignited in your heart. Amen? Hallelujah. The second thing I noticed in those two verses simply is this. And it just it, it hit me again this, this week. He preached the kingdom. He taught Jesus. He didn't hang their feet over the, over the pit of hell. His number one job was to teach them to operate in God's system. And, and again, evangelists evangelize. But do you understand evangelism isn't about hanging their feet over it? It's about going there with a the fire. It's going there um, to, to witness what God's done for you. Uh, when, when, when Woody Woodson comes here and, all, and, and most of his is, go, is going, uh, so many of his stories are just energizing because you're like, man, if he can do it, I know he's crazy, but if he can do it, I can do it. He, he'd been on the streets and he was, he was ministering on the streets. And this is one of my favorite stories of his. He's, he was ministering on the streets and he saw a, a gang member give their life to Jesus. And, and, he, and, and the gang member sitting there kind of tucked in his coat with a big Uzi. And, uh, and, and uh, the, the, he goes, what do I do with this? And he said, do you want me to take it to the authorities? He said, I'll leave your name out of it. I'll just turn it in. And he goes, please do. Because his life has changed. So, so he puts it in his car and he's driving down the road. And as he's driving down the road, something happened. And I don't know exactly what happened, but a car was doing the road rage thing to him and, uh, and, and pulled up alongside of him to give him, uh, to give him the one finger salute. And, and, and he was just like, you don't mess with a guy after he just led somebody to Jesus. And so he just reached over and, just, and picked up the Uzi and showed it to the man. The man he goes, just pulled off. And I was like, I, I know there's only one Woody Woodson. I get that, um, uh, but but our job our job is to give the good news. Our job is to teach the kingdom. And again, going back to point number one, don't let it fade away. But what if times change? Don't let it fade. Preach the kingdom. Teach Jesus. Don't 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 change your thinking. Don't start changing doctrine or theology because of 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 what people are doing. And I like the, the concept there. He says he preached it with all confidence. And, and the, the point there is with bluntness, freely and openly. He didn't sit there and go, hey, I don't want to get in trouble. 
But Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you, so you could, he took he took your sick he took your sicknesses so you'd be healed, and he took your right he became sin so you could be the righteousness of God. And he took your poverty so you could be rich. You know he no he's he's like this is how it is this is the truth, and he didn't he didn't change it because of what was going on around him. So don't change what you teach pastors and people. If the people don't like it, keep preaching it. If the people don't do it, keep teaching it. If everyone around you, all the other churches change, don't change. Keep preaching it. Amen? And, and, amen. And then no man forbidding him just simply is, is dealing with the fact is that it didn't mean everybody accepted him. It just mean, meant that the Roman government, the Roman Senate, um, the, the police that were watching over him didn't stop him. They just let him preach. Which again would have culminated in him standing before Nero. Which is crazy. Because one of the last things Nero did was kill Paul. Not, not, I'm not saying like he killed him. But he killed himself. But in that same year or within a year of him killing himself, he killed Paul. But six years earlier, he had an opportunity to respond to the goodness of God. Amen. All right. So, so again, Acts 29. Let's let's just move here. We're going to go kind of quickly on a lot of this because I just kind of want to get to the last point. But there's a couple things we'll say along the way. Um, Acts 29. Again, yeah, we know there's no Acts 29 in Scripture. It goes from Acts 28 to Romans chapter one. But that's not the end of Paul's life. And so I thought, let's let's go ahead and finish it up. Let's find out what he did in Rome. Because right now we just got him in Rome preaching for two years. What did he do after that? A matter of fact, there's a lot of people who start getting messed up because they think at the end of these two years is when he got got killed. Um, it's not. Um, and and we'll, we'll deal with that. We'll just show that here in a little bit. So we're at, we're at AD 60 AD, not Eddie, but <laughs> Edward. Edward, now this is, this is, so I don't need to say AD anymore. We're not, we're not talking about BC, okay? Uh, from 60 to 62, Paul was in prison in Rome. During that time in Rome, uh, again, he taught, he did all that kind of stuff, and he wrote the four prison epistles. The four prison epistles are Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. Um, which again, in, in, uh, in Philippian, in Philippians, in the in the Philippians, he makes mention that I want to visit you. Now remember, this is in Rome. John, go ahead and put the map up, and just leave the map up for uh, that the new one that I put on there. It's a little bit small, but um, it's, but but it takes up more ground. Uh, and it'll no, the other the other one. Yeah, this is our new one because it takes the wide Jerusalem's down here. Uh, right there's Ephesus and and uh, and Corinth. Over here's Rome and Spain. I, I kind of redid it in red so you could actually see because uh, because it isn't smaller. But while he's in Rome, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. And in Philemon and in Philippians, he says, "I want to come visit you." Uh, and and so you can see Rome's over here. Um, Philippi's up there, and uh, Philemon lived in Colossae, uh, around Colossae. So you can see that it's way back over there. Um, uh, Paul stands before Nero approximately at A.D. 62 and is apparently found innocent since he was released. I don't think he escaped, um, which is, again, a point I want to bring across here simply as God promised him. Remember, God's, God's, uh, when he's in the middle of the storm, he said, you must stand before Caesar. Beloved, I don't care what's going on around you right now. If God promised it, he will carry it through. The question is, will you stop short? Because he won't. Amen? Um, so no matter how bad things look, keep going, because it did for him. Uh, and, and, and then he definitely didn't just stand in front of Paul, because we already know we're standing in front of King Agrippa, that it wasn't about him just uh, defending himself. It wasn't like tapping into his lawyer skills. 
he w- he ministered to Nero. So Nero would have had an opportunity to change. Nero was disgusting. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that in just a second. But once Paul is released, he's uh, he has about six years of ministry remaining. It could be five, but but uh, but it, it's uh, most think it's about 68. Some think 67. And I'm not arguing. So about six years of ministry remaining. Um, and he wasn't one to waste time. Remember, he had an assignment to do. He's going to do his assignment. Um, from the time he leaves there, and this is just, these are just dates to, to put down. In 64, he wrote Hebrews. In 66, he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. And then in 68, he wrote his final epistle, which is 2 Timothy. And that was just before his death. It was when he was actually in custody in Rome. Now, the rest of the, uh, most of the rest of the timeline is somewhat, we, ca- we have to piece together because of other scriptures, uh, because of uh, 1 Timothy, Titus, and, and 2 Timothy. Uh, we have to kind of piece together what he did after that. Um, or his plans that, that he gave in uh, the prison epistles. Uh, there, there is no way to understand what order they came in, but most Christ, most uh, tradition, uh, as far as not Chris, Christian history, not tradition, but Christian history, says that he went from Rome to Spain. Uh, in, in, in Romans chapter 15, he says, hey, when I'm heading to Spain, I'll stop by and see you. And this was in 57, a, AD 57, right? And so, so, so he's at Rome. So it would be cl- the closest he ever was to Spain to go over and to minister in Spain. And, uh, and, and so, so we're going to piece this together, uh, probably consensus of people I studied, but it's not, you know, someone goes, I think you went here first. That's what I'm talking about. Um, I, I, I'm not arguing this thing, but, but he, here's the stops that he made along the way. So a, A.D. 62 through 64, Paul goes west to Spain. Um, and taught the kingdom there for probably about two years. Now, two years could have included the travel time. It could have included a lot of things. Uh, but most people believe it was about two years that he ministered there. Um, and again, uh, Romans 15, 22 through 29, he mentioned Spain. Uh, that, that That's his desire to go there. Again, what's it? I, I, I'm committed to the assignment, going to all the world. Um so the so the second stop that we see here, um, would, would we probably get our directions? What most people believe is that he took off from Spain and went just north of Africa there, and went down, followed uh, down to Crete. Titus chapter one verse five, um, it says, "For this cause left I Crete, left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are waiting." And, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. So he went, he went there from Spain, went over to Crete uh, with Titus or met Titus there and, um, and ministered there for a little bit and then left Titus there. Um, 2 Timothy 4.20 um, says, uh, says, uh, gives us his third stop. And again, I'm, these are not necessarily definite, but... Um, it says, uh, Troph- Trophimus, have I left in Miletum sick? So here it's Miletus. Um, on maps it's Miletus, but it's right underneath Ephesus. So it would have made a, he could have done this any way he wanted to do it, but you can see it just makes a loop right there. He went over to Miletus over there, and, uh, and, and we don't know what he did there. There's nothing that, uh, did. he just, he left, uh, he left, Trophimus there sick. That's all we know. Stop number four probably was Ephesus. It's literally right right next to it, right above it. It could have been Colossae, but whichever one it is, we'll, we'll cover both of them. Um, but this was just a short short, short journey north. Um, would get him to Ephesus. And remember, Timothy is the pastor there. Um now, now, this is so important here because about 64 AD, 64 BC, it's 80s before. About AD 64 is when, um, is when uh, Nero burns Rome down. 
And so it was just after that, which would have been in the vicinity of what time he's, that, 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 that Nero's in trouble and he's blamed it on the Christians and, and things start rising up. Listen, when God moves, the devil gets irritated. Don't be surprised when he gets irritated in your, at you, okay? And so this has to be about that time. And so, so he, he swings by there to love on Timothy, but he also understands what Timothy's up against. I read one place that, that Timothy's church there in Ephesus was about 100,000 members. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a church. That's a, a few assistant pastors there. Um, but Paul would have understood the, situation, the stru- situations and struggles that Timothy was, in the, Timothy was in the middle of at Ephesus. He would have experienced it. Matter of fact, I'm not going to look here. I'm just going to give you the... I, the, the uh, well, I'll read, but 2 Timothy 4, verse 14 and 15, it says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Now remember, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy are on the, the other side of Ephesus. So he's talking literally about what happened when I visited you in Ephesus. In Ephesus. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. That seems like a prayer. Um, of whom you need to be aware also, because he greatly withstood our words. So he was just telling. He, he was he was the one that was going to get. He was the one that was on on uh, Instagram arguing everything, right? Um, so he faced that in Second Timothy chapter one verse fifteen. Um, while he was in Ephesus, Asia is over here. This is Asia Minor. Right? He said the many in Asia. Matter of fact, he said all in Asia, but it was probably a group of people um, had turned their backs on him. Um, Also, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, um, uh, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, uh, Onesiphorus, uh, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Um, So again, this was, this was, and again, why did they why did they back up? Because he was in prison. He went to Rome. He stood before Caesar. He's a criminal, right? We don't want to. We don't have any of those around our parts. The Holy Spirit told said it like this to me: Who are you? It'd be better if I could pronounce this name better. Are you on uh, Onesiphorus or Phagellus? Phagellus is one of them that turned themselves away. In Asia, who are you when your brothers and your sisters are facing struggles? When they're, when people are rising up against them, do you just add to the problem? Do you turn your back on your brother and sisters? Are you the one that has their back? When the people around you starts talking against those that you're in relationship with, and those that are your pastor, your pastor's wife, your associate, the, the, the associate pastors, just the lay people that sit around you, when people start talking about them negatively, do you just join in and, and, and turn your back on them, or do you defend them? I'm going to just say it like this, Onisiphorus had their back, and when he left, He had energized Paul. That's who we need to be. Amen. The temptation can be there is that is 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 it'd be easier just to go with the crowd, let them say what they want to say. But beloved man, letting them say what they want to say is the same as turning your back on them. Defend those that God has connected you with. Defend those that God has has put you in their camp. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, but Paul left Timothy there, but kept Timothy in his heart. He gets up to Macedonia, which, which is, uh, was one of his next stops. And he writes first Timothy there. So he literally he hadn't been gone very long. And he's like, I need to encourage Timothy. And then, and then when he gets arrested and gets put in Rome, he's like, I, I got to encourage, because I know what Timothy's going up against. I got to encourage him one more time. So his focus is ministering and, and lifting up Timothy. Uh, stop number five would be most likely Colossae, uh, which is where Philemon lived, and he wanted to. He wanted to. He said, "I want to meet you there." So again, then Crete, Miletus, uh, Ephesians, Colossae, 
and then he went up to then he then stop number five, six would have been Macedonia. There is a quick stop at Traus, Troas, um, but but it's just very very. It, I think he dropped something off is, is is what I read. But then he gets up to um, to Macedonia, which Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea are all 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 the cities in Macedonia, and we know nothing about what he did there. Um, but I mean, he's writing to the Colossians and goes, "You need to be more like Macedonia, Church of Macedonia." He writes to the Church of Macedonia and said, "My God shall supply all your needs." People have taken that so much out of context, and I understand because it's in the Bible, so it doesn't apply to everybody. No, it only applies to those that did what Philipp, uh, the Philippians did. Stop number seven. Um, he comes down that coast, most likely, and stops in uh, Nicopolis. And again, not a whole lot is said there. Um, uh, Titus 3 says, um, be diligent to come unto me uh, to Nicopolis because that's where I'm going to winter. So he's actually staying there for the winter. Then he comes down to Corinth, and that and that's where he finishes this. Uh, I've heard people call this the fourth missionary journey. I've also heard people call it the fifth because they consider his journey in the ship the, fir- uh, the fourth one. I don't care, but but he knew he had some work to get done, and he went to get it done. Well, that leads us to the, 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 the finality of his life. We really don't know where Paul was when he was arrested. He would have been arrested about in A.D. Uh, 67 or 68. We know that he was brought back to Rome where he wrote his final letter to Timothy. So if you read 2 Timothy now with that concept that this was the last thing he sent out, so it would have been of utmost importance. Several people came to visit him, and I'm not going to go through the, the names of all of them. But it, all, it, but it says that many others abandoned him. And again, I'll just re- reiterate, who are you? Amen. So, so, so what, we don't, what we do know factually, and, I'll, and again, of history, Nero was a Roman empire that he, stood, that he stood in front of and he ministered to, so it would have been real easy to put a face with the one with the, one, with the Christians, right? Uh, Nero came to, to the throne at age 16, and for a few years he was decent because he, he was young and he had a lot of vi- advisors around him, and so they, 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 took, they dealt with him, or they, they, they led him correctly. But then he got too full of himself and, de- and decided to have all of his advisors killed, so he killed a slew of people. He was known for his murderous acts. He killed his stepbrother, he killed his mother. Uh, and, and, and that's just kind of, you know, plus so many others. Because he didn't want anybody to tell him what to do. His mind literally snapped. Um, everyone was afraid of him because he enjoyed murdering people. So he informed the Senate that he wanted to, to tear down the oldest part of Rome and rebuild it with a massive palace for him in the middle of Rome. He wanted to be the center of everything that was in Rome. But the Senate it st- took a stand and, and would not permit it. So to get his ways, way, he instructed the servants to go out and to burn down the old section of Rome. And it got out of hand because, the, again, Rome's, Rome's right on the coast there, and so the winds would blow, and, and it actually burnt down way more of Rome than what he intended uh, to. Uh, the old, the old state, uh, statement that, um, that Nero played the fiddle while, uh, while Rome burned, it's, it, they, don't, they don't have any proof on that one, but the point is, is that he watched it burn with, with glee. Well, the Senate um, found out through the grapevine, they heard it through the grapevine, uh, that, that it was Nero and his servants who did this. And so they called Nero to, uh, to, to stand before them. And as he was standing before them, um, they were like, uh, he, he just, this idea came to him. I'm, in, I'm dead <clears throat> if I don't say something. And I would, um, I would almost guarantee you that the face of, of Paul rose, put, put, came to his face. And, 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 and history says, I'm not, not going to bring these out, <clears throat> but there was five reasons why he pointed out that it was the Christians. It's the Christians who burned out. we got to go after them. <clears throat> and this was in 64 AD. And so, uh, so during that time, they began hunting down Christians, <clears throat> and their focus was the four biggest cities, 
which Ephesus was one of them. 64, 66, <clears throat> Paul wrote 1 Timothy. 68, he wrote 2 Timothy. <clears throat> because a lot of Timothy's people were quitting because they didn't want to die. <clears throat> and so that, that, that ushered in that era of, of crazy church persecution, early church persecution. <clears throat> Paul was believed in, in AD 68 to, to be beheaded. Um, and and th that, that is what started the wave of persecution amongst Christians. Nero uh, committed suicide that same year <clears throat> because the Senate realized <clears throat> he was up to no good. So my final question, you ready? And I'll wrap it up. On time. Maybe. <clears throat> That's my final question, so it depends on how long this question goes. How committed are you to the things of God, to the kingdom of God? How committed are you to church, to giving, to tithing, to, to the word? What would cause you to stop? You, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking how the, the early church faced death. That, that church in Ephesus had so many people there around them, and, and it, it was a matter of life and death, and some, some ran, some changed, some hid their, their, their faith. And some stood boldly. Paul stood boldly. And for us, we get an unexpected bill and we bail on our giving. We get, we get, uh, I'm trying to think of how to word this. We, we get something else to do on a church night and we bail on attending. We, we, we get faced with, it, with, you might think it's a huge battle, but it's not a battle that's going to cost you your life. It's just a battle that could set you behind on your payments and, and you bail on the things of God, the work, the, what God has for you. And so I'm not asking you today if you're willing to die for Jesus, but don't fool yourself into thinking if you're not willing to stand in the middle of the battle and keep doing what you know to do, don't fool yourself into thinking that, that if things ever got as bad as it was here, that you'd be the brave one that stands in the middle of the church service and say, I will serve God no matter what. If you're faithful in the little, God can trust you with much. And again, I'm not standing here trying to create some kind of uh, of, of legalistic, heavy-hearted thing where it's like, yeah, I don't want to die. You know, it's, it's, are you willing to die for me? I mean, are you? But how, how about this? Are, are you willing to just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing even when the battle gets a little bit rough? Do you understand that's the whole concept with, the, with, 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 with trials and persecutions? It's not that God's trying to, trying to you know, again, dangle your feet against the heat to, uh, to see if, if, if you'll, if you'll uh, retreat. Dangle your feet against the heat to see if you will retreat. It's not a matter that God, God's dangling y'all. But see, but see, what are you going to do with the word that you've gotten in the middle of the battle? Because if God can trust you when you've got $100 to be faithful in your... Well, if God can, t can trust you when you got zero in the bank and you get paid and you got bills due, if he can trust you to bring your tithe into the storehouse at that point, then he knows that if I double your pay, if I get involved in your behalf and your, in your finances, then I can trust you with the more. If he can trust you in the little bit, he can trust you with the more. Why was Paul able to see the revivals he saw? Why was he able to see the ministry opportunities that he saw why was he why was his ministry growing why did he why did he get loaded down with wealth on on a small island in the middle of, uh, of the mediterranean sea how could that happen to him why why won't it happen to me because paul was, would just was convinced that there's nothing that will separate me from the love of god 
There's nothing that will stop me from operating under his love and his power. And if there's nothing that will stop me from that, then there's nothing that will stop God. If God can find a generous person, then he's found somebody that he can be generous to. The question is, is that who you are? Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We got got it done. That was it. Amen? I I could share Hebrews 10 where it says, the just... uh, Live by faith. If any man draw back, don't draw back. Stay faithful with what he's giving you. You might say, but it's not enough right now. If you stay faithful, one day it'll be more than enough. Amen? Hallelujah. How? How? That's not our job. It's God's job. He'll bring a wind from the north and bring a bunch of $100 bills in your yard. I don't know. But he'll bring the wind. You just bring the believing. Amen? Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I just, I am so, I am so stoked. Just to, you know, not just to finish Acts. <laughs> that, that, that's a nice uh, start there. But just the word that we've received throughout these, these years, these months of, of the, the word of, of walking by faith and living by faith and, and relationships and Holy Ghost and power and, and you go through, you know, joy. I mean, I, I don't, you name the topic, it's been covered. Uh, but Father, your desire is not just that we know. It's not just that we come in here and be able to pass a written exam. But your desire is that we walk. That we're not dull of hearing, that we did, that comes in one side, goes out the other, but that, it, that we hear with. We see with our eyes, we hear with our ears, and we understand with our hearts. And that the light of your word is lit up inside of us. And it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So, Father, tonight I do pray, Father, that you will will encourage us, Father, to be the ones that are refreshers and not the ones that turn our backs. That you will encourage us, Father, to be the ones that stand against all opposition to the enemy so that you can trust us with more. And Father, we thank you that with your power, we can do all things. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.